We had a remarkable session today on adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia with a lot of new therapeutic options just to set the scene. We cure now about 60% of the adult ALL and uh, in adolescents we already achieve 70 to 80% cure, five years and longer. However, we would like to reduce the intensity of the chemotherapy we would like to reduce the stem cell transplantation, and we also focus on elderly patients. So uh, we discussed more or less all these topics. And the first one was uh, how oncogenetic can improve uh, the classification in, in ALL. Yes, I thought that was actually uh, a topic that pervaded several of the, uh, of the talks. Um, some, some very elegant presentations which actually, I think, bring us to the new level uh, of diagnostics. Uh, in, in a way, we're taking the same pattern as from chemotherapy where we combined agents and with the MRD, now we combine MRD with other uh, oncogenetic uh, profiles and, and actually some very simple old-fashioned things like wet blood count, which, which actually are reappearing as, as a discriminator. We discussed uh, today, uh, actually in every talk, minimal residual disease. Uh, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we are in the lucky situation that 95% uh, have their individual markers. But I think it, in nearly every new therapy, MRD is guiding the avenue. Absolutely, and uh, what, what does strike me is that in areas like pH positive ALL, uh, we still don't have a, a common uniform approach to MRD. And uh, we, we recently had a, a meeting with Heike Pfeiffer uh, from, from the Frankfurt Group, uh, who's been working since 2007 on standardizing uh, the uh, MRD analysis and pH positive ALL. So lagging behind, but I, I, I think that despite uh, all the improvements, uh, standardization still is the major avenue that we have to perceive, uh, pursue. I think that is one. The other is uh, we have a really good prediction if an adult ALL patient is MRD negative, the probability to be cured is 70%. However, we have also 30%, they achieve a molecular remission, but despite this, they relapse. Now the question is, uh, do you think that uh, next generation sequencing or digital droplet PCR going to a deeper sensitivity could improve it or it's more a hope? Well, I, I personally am convinced that more sensitivity is going to improve things. Uh, but what strikes me is that we always try to extrapolate from maybe two or three early time points uh, onto what will happen over several years. And, and I mean, actually data that, that I showed was that we have relapses over the, the course of first, second, and third year of treatment. And what I'm wondering whether or not this approach of having only early analysis is really appropriate or if we shouldn't do it like the CML community do who over time throughout treatment actually serially measure MRD and, and also act on, uh, on in small increments. And, and looking at the cost, I, I think that actually MRD is not so expensive that in view of the treatment options, uh, it, it really makes a dent. So what you mean is uh, we should follow longer minimal residual disease. You showed it clearly that in Philadelphia positive ALL, which are 25% of our patients and 50 of all older patients, a, con a constant follow-up of MRD is necessary. Yes. And it might well be with our very uh, promising new immune therapies that there is the same case. We have to go for longer periods. I agree. And I, I think that uh, the, the, the lack of therapies that we had before was also the reason why it wasn't widely adopted. In, after transplant, it has been accepted more widely. There was you know, TKI, donor lymphocyte infusions, whatever. But I, I think only now are we actually in a position to act uh, on an MRD signal prior to transplant. And, and so hopefully this will, will promote uh, a more stringent serial analysis.
we uh, discussed in several presentations the role of stem cell transplantation. This is after chemotherapy so far our curative approach. However, still we have a 20% treatment related mortality. It even increases in the older patients. So clearly the wish is to substitute allo transplant, also it's curative, by uh, any other therapy like the immunotherapies. But there is a kind of hope. So what uh, do you think uh, is a r situation in reality? Well, everyone wants to get rid of transplant. And, and when it comes down to making the decision, it is the tried and trusted uh, uh, curative option. Uh, and, and we do tend to ignore all the, the you know, graft versus host and the long-term morbidity uh, issues, uh, which, which are improving nowadays. I, I think that, the, that what we have to do to get rid of transplant is actually to use all of our newer agents in the frontline setting. And with frontline, I, I mean, MRD positive as a trigger is fine, but I think we have to move them up even earlier because that's where all of the prior treatment have really made an impact and, and not later on. And then I think they, we will have a realistic option together with the, the MRD and the other risk predictors uh, to fine tune treatment to an extent that we will actually start seeing a drop in transplant. It's also interested uh, in transplant, we had these strict age limits, 50 years, uh, 60 years now, as in your study, patients above 65 or elderly patients are transplanted with uh, reasonable good results. So it's even not out in the elderly patients. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we had results uh, of 61% long-term survival with a median age of 61. Um, and although in that trial there were very few haplotransplants, uh, and although many people would still consider them a little bit premature, uh, the, the Chinese are using them all the time. Uh, and with the post-transplant cyclophosphamide, the patients, the elderly patients that I've seen, actually go through it with almost with ease. I don't want to make it sound trivial, but but I. Uh, I, I do see a huge improvement uh, over the conventional uh, conditioning regimens and immunosuppressive regimens. Two other topics raised today, which are the real great promise in ALL, is the immunotherapies mm -hmm. and uh, several new generations of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Can you comment first on the last one? Because we have now many of those. I, I, I th actually, I, I think it is very encouraging and, and, and interesting that the kinase inhibitors are now also uh, being applied in the uh, non-Philadelphia positive population or part of it, uh, like the Philadelphia-like or BCR-able-like population, uh, where, you know, pranathenib seems to have considerable promise. And, and I think we will follow the same pattern. We will combine it with immunotherapy. Uh, be it a bispecific antibody or an immunoconjugate, um, and we will benefit from the experience that we have had in the, in the pH positive. So I, I think that in, uh, in a couple of years, uh, we will probably get rid of a large part of chemotherapy in a substantial fraction uh, of, the, uh, of the patients by early introduction of immunotherapy. But just to say, I mean, Okay, one of the intention is to reduce the chemotherapy, but we have to realize 90% of the children are cured still with a simple combination chemotherapy. Yes. You know, that's the point. And it's also cheap compared to anything what's coming up. So we have to think uh, very carefully where we substitute chemo being successful with the limitation that it doesn't work in this intensity in elderly patients uh, to be replaced by the other one. But uh, I just want to come back to the Philadelphia positive. There were only 10% surviving 15 years ago, 10% mm -hmm. in all the international studies. It was the worst subgroup. Mm -hmm. Now, with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor you in a transplant, the cure rate is 60% in all the studies. And this is a real great achievement. So moving away, it's a risk. 
Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, w when I started working on pH positive ALL, everybody thought I was crazy because it was ridiculous. It was a waste of time. It was dismal. And, and, and now it is a paradigm, actually, for uh, successful targeted therapy. Uh, but coming back to the, uh, the pediatricians, uh, who actually using the, the same regimens that we have, TKI and, and plus chemotherapy, are even better than we are in, in terms of their cure rates, which makes it more difficult for them uh, because they have more to lose by reducing the, the toxicity. So it, it's the, they're, they're the victim of their own success in a way. Yes, but uh, uh, if we argue with age, I mean, the adults are not elderly children. <laughs> We have, uh, we have different genetic markers, and I think this beautiful concept of curing 90% in children works just in children. Yes. And as older you are, you less tolerate the chemotherapy. So we are now in a, in a, in a new era where we explore the new drugs, that we, we will just uh, discuss as next point, the immunotherapy, where we start in the elderly patients mm -hmm. to avoid any deaths with intensive chemo, uh, reduce the transplant and explore the new uh, avenues with immunotherapies. Yeah, it's almost a reversal of what we did before, where we learned from the pedi from the pediatric doctors and, and the children's study, and, and 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 now it's it's almost the opposite. I guess we will we have to show it in the elderly, where is much room for improvement, and it's in generally considered in the U.S. and everywhere to improve the elderly is a medical need. We will do it most likely with the immunotherapies, and then we go back to the adults, and finally, the pediatrician will adapt the things which are safe. Yeah, and, and speaking of, uh, of the US, uh, and, and having a chat with some of our US colleagues, uh, they, they actually have a huge problem by the general availability of these immunoconjugates and, and, and immuno-oncology drugs, because everybody can use them as they like. They're no lo patients are no longer entered into clinical trials, uh, and, and, and so I think in Europe, we're probably even better placed with our trial discipline to achieve exactly the, the data uh, that, that you're referring to. Yeah. I think the, what we heard today, the results with the B-specific uh, antibody plenatumumab with the CD22 inotuzumab, we did not discuss in intensively CAR-T. We are moving to a new era. And the, the important thing is to find out what is uh, the best place in frontline therapy. And this can only be done in prospective trials. Yeah. Whether I, I, doubt, I doubt that one immunotherapy is sufficient therapy to cure. We mostly need a combination of two approaches, a little bit of chemo and then the immunotherapy. But we need prospective trial to see whether CAR T cells is first, or inotuzumab, or plenatumumab. Yeah, and in that context, I, I think that the uh, the transnational and international trials are, are really of huge value, uh, like the uh, AVAL trials, European Working Group for Adult ALL, because we don't have the patient numbers otherwise. Uh, but it's not only the numbers and being able to conduct the trial. I think this constant scientific exchange uh, between and among colleagues from, from different countries is, is a huge benefit uh, to, to promote the field. So uh, we have now what's absolutely needed and which is done in controlled trial to bring the immunotherapies in front line, already to have combination, and then to compare the real promising CAR T cells and plenatumumab and inotuzumab side by side. If we have this studies finished, we will have a picture, which is so far not a guarantee that everything is for solved. No, absolutely, but I think it's scientifically extremely exciting, and, and I think exciting for the, uh, for the patients as well. Yeah, I think uh, this is probably at the end a message in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a very rare disease, you know. Uh, it, it has uh, shown in children that you can cure the disease uh, just with chemotherapy, but now we have all the new options which are not available in this extent in the in the other diseases. So it's, as you said, it's a very exciting time. And uh, at in the next meetings, I think we will, we have the comparison and we will know what the frontline setting is. And then 
I have no prediction what the cure rate will be.